a few years ago, I was struck by the fact that I'm English, which sounds like a weird thing maybe to be struck by. But I was thinking about the fact that England is a very small country, small population, but in recent human history, it's had a very kind of outsized effect on the world. You know, um, you're listening to me now in English. You know, this is listened to and watched all over the world. All of North America speaks English um, as the kind of primary language of the state. Australia, New Zealand, you know, you don't need me to tell you um, how widely spread the English language is. And that's because of the history of this tiny little country. And I thought it was kind of strange that I found myself being English. Out of all the possibilities, I ended up being English. And I was thinking, well, how likely is that? You know, why am I not Chinese? There are a lot more Chinese people in the present moment. And also, how is it that I find myself existing here today and not in the future or in the past? You know, we find ourselves at a very strange moment in human history or the history of everything we know, you know, on this planet where technology is changing so rapidly. And, you know, for all we know, there are only several generations left before a bunch of different apocalyptic scenarios, you know, so this seems like a very strange time to be alive. And I started thinking about what it would mean, what it means to ask that question of what are the odds of being you, of finding yourself here as opposed to somewhere else. And before I could kind of go down any, try and make any calculations, you know, which is not what I'm going to be um, doing here. So sorry if you're expecting a number. Um, but before I, I, you know, got to that point, I was kind of, I was thinking that something wasn't right in the way I was thinking about this. And it landed pretty quickly because it's this kind of, you know, in this very much in this area of um, the stuff I talk about here, that it doesn't really if you try to conceptually lay out what you mean by, you know, thinking about the strangeness of you being you, you can come up against this kind of mystical vision of unity <laughs> where you would say something like we're all one uh, or we are each other, which kind of leads to deep kind of um, change in one's ethics. You know, if, if you move from being primarily concerned with yourself and maybe, you know, people you, you uh, who relate to you in some important way, if you move from that to concern for all beings because you recognize them to be of a piece with the same stuff that you, that makes you, you, um, yeah, then this, this kind of perspective can have a very dramatic change in your ethics. The fact of the matter is that at this point in time, in this place, there is an English guy called James. He exists at this time and place. And the reason he exists can be accounted for by the whole history of the planet, of the universe, you know, how it is that atoms became molecules and molecules became life and single-celled organisms became multicellular and then they became, you know, animals like mammals and then primates and then humans. And there's a whole causal chain there that leads to a James existing now in the same way that there's a whole causal chain that leads to oxygen molecules existing. You know, if you said, what are, what are the odds of being an, a, an oxygen molecule? Well, that's not really, doesn't really mean anything to say that. Oxygen molecules exist as part of the unfolding nature of reality. And where they exist at certain times, they exist. And where they don't exist at other times, they don't exist. And that's the more accurate objective perspective. Now, we don't usually think this way because we evolved this cognitive capacity to apply a category to ourselves and think that there's some identity, some, something that makes James James over and above the process that, that is unfolding in this bit of space time. But there's no difference. The oxygen molecule and James are just two bits of reality unfolding in a causal way. And this kind of also points to issues around free will because we usually identify with the ego and the ego is felt to be this identity that makes decisions. But when one moves into a state of consciousness where you let go of the ego, I shouldn't say you let go, where the ego 
feels like an appearance in consciousness and you can notice that consciousness is prior to the ego, then there can be this witnessing and the witnessing is just the fact of consciousness. There can be this witnessing of the ego going about its business like some kind of automaton, some kind of jabbering machine, you know, I can, if I cast my attention wide right now, I can notice that these words are just coming out. It's all just happening. And, you know, we could talk about the circuits in the brain that make that possible, you know, how they evolved. There's a whole story that leads to me being here right now. But as I'm talking, I'm not willing these words to come out. My awareness is just silent. It's the space in which all of this is happening. And that awareness is pristine and silent and it's not doing anything. It's not willing these words to come out. It's not identified with all the things I could take to be James, you know? I, if I think of who I am right now, the concept of James not only includes my physical organism, my identity is also tied up in trivial things like my clothing and, you know, decisions I make, words I choose, my behavior, all of these things comprise my identity. And we can acknowledge that my jumper or sweater, if you're American, uh, or whatever other English language words, sorry, if I don't want to just cater to two nationalities. Um, this is not as much me as my head is. You know, I feel my head to be more important to my identity, not least because it's important for my life process, but you know, my fingernails are clearly part of me in this kind of concept of me, but they're not as, as crucial to my identity as, say, my whole hand. You know, I can still live without my whole hand, but it's more me than my fingernails are. And then if you, my head is more me than my hand is. And, you know, you can see here that there's a hierarchy of how central these different things are to the concept of, of me or you. <laughs> but they're all... There's no, it would seem as if they're all, the hierarchy is based on some idea that they're approaching the core essence of James. You know, if you keep going in, you go inside the head and you go inside the brain and somewhere in there is the essence of James and the things that are closer to that are more James. But it turns out there's nothing in there. There's no self, there's no soul, there's no identity, there's no core, there's no nucleus. The organism is a process and the process has the capacity to look back on itself and say to itself, that's James. And it's just the saying, it's just the concept, it's just the thoughts. And so when one identifies with consciousness or the witnessing behind the ego, that's just another kind of automatic mechanistic appearance in consciousness, well then, What's recognized is my, the ground of being that I really am, that my kind of core nature is, is the fact that being is recognized in consciousness. Consciousness is the space in which things are known. And the simplest thing that appears in consciousness is just the fact that things are appearing. It's the kind of pure essence of it is just the fact that there's not nothing, there's something, and it's being known in consciousness. And that's the simplest thing that can be from our perspective. Without that, there's no knowing of anything. So my most fundamental nature of what I am is going to be the same for everything else that can experience, for you as well. I come into the world and I experience myself to be like a bubble, you know? I'm sealed off from the outside world, from your, your consciousness. And within that bubble, maybe there's dust and there's, you know, peculiarities that I take to be me. That's what differentiates me from all these other bubbles that I start to suspect are around me, but I never get to know their interior. I just know there's just the knowing of this interior. And so what we're talking about here is the insight that when you zoom out, can realize there are billions and billions of other bubbles 
you know, you go from this kind of solipsistic stance where there's just your bubble and you start, you might think about other bubbles, but you're mainly concerned with yourself. And then you can realize there are billions of other bubbles and they're making this whole foam of a single liquid that, that forms bubbles. And to focus on being one of them, if one's interested in what your nature is at bottom, it's misleading, it's inaccurate. It's not objective, it's inherently subjective and biased to focus on the perspective of just the single bubble. What's important is the liquid, the substance that's bringing all this into existence. So your mind can be separate from my mind, but this is the unity of consciousness. When we say that we could say there's only one consciousness and it's not like there's one that somehow exists simultaneously in your mind and my mind you know, just a single unitary thing. But when we say there's only one consciousness, we're more saying it's not divided up in the way we think it is. It's divided up in the way that bubbles are divided up. The forms separate, but the consciousness is the same. And so when you ask yourself the question of what are the odds of, of being you, you can be confronted by the fact that what you are, if you are anything, is this fact of being appearing in consciousness. And so right now, over here, the experience of James is being known. Where you are, the experience of you is being known. In medieval England, when witches were being burned and there was a guy standing by the fire, the same experience, the same thing that we are, was there. And so there's a sense in which if I can say I'm anything, I am you, I am that medieval peasant, I'll be the child that's born after I'm dead. The I, if it's going to be applied to anything, should be applied to this thing that's beyond the trivial little, little self that appears in consciousness that we usually reserve the word I for. So